I titled this uh, Judge Not, <clears throat> because you're going to hear in the apostate church their, their doctrine on this. Don't judge me. Right? And then they'll say that you don't have the fruits of the Spirit if, you, if you're judging somebody. You know, oh, you're judgmental. Judge not lest ye be judged. That's all they know. That's all they'll say. But let's analyze this. Because this is what happens when people are presumptuous. In fact, I'm going to start in John. I was, I'm in Luke, but I, I need to go to John first to show you something. So I hope I remember where I, I think it's John 8. John 8. Where is it? Where did you go? <clears throat> I'll find it. to go I can't find it I thought I would be able to find it but listen it's I think it's in John 8 I can't use my phone good morning but it in somewhere in John the Messiah says I and I don't want to read the whole thing because I can't see it but he says that um, I judge no man you judge by the flesh I, I judge no man by the flesh or something along those lines by the flesh that's the point when he says, I judge no man by the flesh, what do you think he's talking about? He's talking, he's telling them that they judge by the flesh, but he judges no man by the flesh. Oh. No, that's not it. I wish I had it, his words down pat here, read it right out of the book. But I know, I'm, I'm telling you, I know what that means, so I'm trying to... Uh, give you evidence of this so you understand how badly the church has twisted it. The, when he says the flesh, he's talking about sacrificial law. He judges no man by sacrificial law. That's not why he came. So that was the point. That's a, there's a proof there. That's why I really wish I could have found it. But let me see if I can access my phone. Well, I'm, I don't think I can. I might shut the video off if I try. But... Man, I wish I could find it. I want you to hear it. Oh, maybe. The way the Messiah talked to people, he would call them hypocrites and he would, he would um, tell them they're of their father, the devil. And things like that. So ultimately, from the perspective of even how the Christian church wants to, to say this, um, Christ actually, by the definition of the church, Christ was judging people all the time by their own definition, which they're telling you not to do to do to them, okay? And which they won't lift a finger to do for anybody else either, okay? So if I were to walk up to the pastor and say, you're a hypocrite. Oh, you hypocrite of your father, the devil. All the people in the church standing around me would say, oh, that guy's so judgmental, right? If I walked into the church and I said, Pastor Bob, you're teaching all these people to do pagan witchcraft, you hypocrite. You're of your father, the devil. If I were to go into a church and say that, they would all be just astounded that I would do such a thing. Although that's what loving your neighbor as yourself is. When you 
when you don't judge by the flesh, when he's talking to these people had hatred in their hearts for people. That's one indicator right there. So the way they were judging was off of the way sacrificial law is. Sacrificial law was there was a penalty for sin. So if if you were to do idolatry, you would be you were supposed to be killed in according to sacrificial law. Now all of Israel started doing that and they ended up getting booted out. But there was a time you can look back where the guy had the wool mixed with linen. Okay, I use that because that's how come people don't understand things that are in the law. The law is spiritual. It was meant for people to understand what it what it was really saying. Okay? And then when you when you hear those times like like the scripture where it says God is not the author of confusion, for example. But then when you read sacrificial law, it's it's got all these things and, and stuff in there. What was God trying to point out to the people? He was trying to point out, isn't it a lot easier just to keep the covenant I told you from the beginning? That's the point. See, God is putting them through a punishment. That's why Hebrews was written to explain that. But people won't hear that. And in the church. The church is like the most erroneous thing out there right now. Because there's all the different denominations, they're all just preaching whatever the heck they want to hear in their ears, which the Bible tells you all this stuff is going to happen. And this is where everybody's gone wrong. Just mind your own business. Do as thou wilt, which is doctrine from Satan, the doctrine of demons. And he lifted, I'm on, I'm in right now, I'm in Luke 6, starting at verse 20. <sighs> And he lifted up his eyes to his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now you should analyze that the disciples, although they were probably not poor financially, they were fishermen, they were probably doing well, they were making good income. What were they poor of? The word of God. That's what they were poor of. They didn't have the word of God, but they, they sought after it. They really wanted it. See, he knew their hearts. This is only Luke 6, okay? He just chose his disciples right here in this, in this chapter. So he says, blessed are <clears throat> the kingdom, or yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for you shall be filled. Hunger for what? Food? No. Blessed are ye that weep now, for you shall laugh. Why would we be weeping or why would they be weeping? Because of the things they're seeing, because they're, they're sensitive to, to, to the sin in this world. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. What's the Son of Man's sake mean? Because whatever he teaches, here's the... Here's the punchline on that because you need to know what he taught and then do what he said and he said teach what I teach that's your job teach what I teach that's a disciple so that's for the son of man's sake and the son of man's sake they've made up they'll make up in the church what that means they'll say oh they rejected the the Jews rejected the Christian Jesus guy of course they did they're not stupid it's the way you guys have laid him out to be it's your presentation of what the Bible calls this guy. Of course, they're going to reject that. They know not to do pagan idolatry. They know that they know that Jesus is a Roman name or a, a Greek name or, or made up by Rome. They, the ones that are, have any intelligence, know that stuff. They're not going to accept the lies the church puts forward. They have their own problems. The Bible says, but they're certainly not going to believe the lies of Rome. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast your, your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. Behold, your re reward is great in, the hev in, in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Even the, the name of the Son of Man is Yeshua. Even... 
the son of man's sake is what he stood for. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. For his name's sake is that he's going to save Israel for his name's sake. That's an idiomatic prophecy and, and slogan that you should know in the Old Testament. But because you guys don't read the Old Testament in the Christ, Christ, Christian church, you don't know what he's even talking about. We're going to prove it even further as we go through this. Because judge not, or you will not be judged. Well, a whole bunch of us want to be judged. Because we're hungry. We want the truth. The poor, they're poor because they have, they don't, they're not fed. But woe unto you that are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Why would he say that? Who's he talking to? Is he talking to the heathen roundabout? Or is he talking to people in the church? He's talking to people in the church. Woe unto you when on all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Mind you of the Christian church. Look at all those guys. But I say unto you, which hear... Which it's, I say unto you, which hear, those of you who can hear this, love your enemies and do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one, ch one cheek, offer also the other, and him taketh away thy cloak, forbid him not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. As, and as ye would that men should do unto you, ye do also to them likewise. Go and read all of Leviticus 19. For if you love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good for you, what think, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much, receive as much gain. But you love your enemy, but love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing. Again, your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is, he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your father also is merciful. He goes right to this. He's giving you a point. He's using the physical to explain the, the spiritual that's in the, in the word of God. He really is. But you're, it's in your behavior too. You know, you have to be forgiving. And the thing is, is you really can't be forgiving without the Spirit of God. People are going to do nasty things to you. When you're doing something like the, in, in my position, okay? I, I've spent a lot, lot of time um, in the trenches of Twitter. I have seen a lot of things happen there. There's people, I have given them so much of my time into the word of God and they're just driving nails and spikes and knives and swords and everything right into my back right now. It doesn't hurt me personally, except for the fact that I pray for these people because as the things are written against them are not good. That's the kind of stuff that this is talking about. Watch this. Judge not and you shall not be judge, judged. Therefore, we shouldn't even open our mouth. Is that what it's saying? No. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. That's a big clause in the law that you want to grab onto and believe and ask God for the power to do that. Because it's not of ourselves. I'm, I'm telling you that right now because it is not of ourselves. I, it's impossible to forgive people 
if you operate under the ways of this world. It's impossible because you you don't have this. The spirit of God will is not dwelling in you normally. Okay, if you're obedient, His spirit is able able's to dwell with you. He doesn't want to dwell in in somebody who's disobedient. But if somebody is obedient, he will dwell with them. And then the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit produces fruit. And that fruit is wisdom about his word. But judging not, you will not be judged. That is much deeper than people think it is. You actually do want to be judged. But you want to be judged righteously. Not by the flesh. He judges no man by the flesh. What was that? That was condemnation. But he judges righteous judgment. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with, with all, it shall be measured to you again. And he spoke a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into a ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. This is the lesson. And why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but perceive not the beam that is in, in thy own eye? Either how can, can thou say to thy brother, brother, let me pull out the mote that is in your eye, when they, thyself behold not the beam that is in his own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thy own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. What's he telling us there? What's in your eye? If your eye causes you to sin, then pluck it out, right? So take that beam out of your eye first so that you can take the beam or the, the, the stick or the twig or whatever was in your brother's eye. So you better be walking in the ways of God first, having his Holy Spirit, having his forgiveness. If you have hatred towards people and you rebuke them with hatred in your heart, that doesn't mean you're not going to sharply rebuke. That needs to be done. But that, does, that, that is not, see, that in, this, in the same sense, if I'm yelling like this, People will say, I think even someone said it in one of my things, oh, you sound angry or something like that. They're not used to that. Of course, I, I'm stern. I am many, many times going to be stern and I always will because there's a great urgency to tell the people the truth so that they can repent, receive the Holy Spirit, and then they can have that, that joy knowing that they're, they're walking in salvation for crying out loud. How will you have it when you got, I'm up, I'm one or there, I don't know how many people are teaching the truth, but you know. Even some of these guys that are teaching the truth aren't ca catching on to the full truth, right? I mean, I see it all the time. Or oh, who are you to say that you're teaching the full truth? Because I don't talk about anything I don't know. There's things I don't know, so I don't talk about those things. I'll mention, some Some of you guys will know, I'll mention things that I'm I'm not sure of. You know, letting it, putting it on the table for you to know that I haven't learned that yet. But the things that I do know are because of what he's already shown me. So therefore, you, you do love your neighbor as yourself. You feed them, you give them, and you don't ask it for return. But that's not talking about, that is not, good morning. That's not talking about um, um, notwithstanding, but it's not, the, the main thing is, like, was Yeshua walking around giving, handing out money? What is he talking about here? For the good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither does the corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. This is the thing. Like when we judge on our own self-righteousness, that's another point that's being made here. Or do we judge, do we judge righteous judgment? Because the, the, the royal commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And we're going to go there again. Sorry for you guys that have gone through this so many times, but I'm trying to use the words of, of Yeshua right here to let people know what this stuff means. For every tree is known of its own fruit for the... For thorns men do not gather figs, nor for bramble bushes gather they grapes. So what's the good fruit? The knowledge of God. So what are you going to give to people? The knowledge of God. That's, what, that's what's, uh, what's going on here. 
You know, what this parable is talking about. Even the thorns, for crying out, the thorns is people who are in the ways of the world. And really, they're after their covetousness and the cares of this life. The thorns is talking about people who chase after money. And, and, and the goods and the, and the, look at the parable of the seed sower. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasures of, of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when you're judging, in what manner you judge, it will be, you will be judged. So if you want to judge after the ways that the, the condemnation even of the sacrificial law in those areas, that's why he says, I don't judge by the sacrificial law. I don't judge by the flesh. What's he, what's he doing? He's elevating the covenant. You know why he's elevating the covenant? Because he's telling, because ultimately, if you direct your heart to obey the covenant, okay? That, that covenant is your marriage covenant, by the way. Church, church, you should have known that. The marriage covenant, the Ten Commandments. He came to teach us to do it the correct way and not to judge with condemnation, but to judge with forgiveness and pull our friends and our brothers and our sisters out of the fire so that they don't suffer the consequence of sin. That's what loving your neighbor as yourself means. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? There's a lot of people that are in a lot of trouble coming up. And this is the wicked generation that's, that's, that's for judgment. They're not going to hear us. They're not going to hear us. They're going to get judged by Almighty. They are, there is a destined group, otherwise it wouldn't be written about, in the church that is going to get cast out and great is the fall of that house because they did not build the house on the rock. You guys, I, I, I've told you last video and I've said it probably many other times, but I grew up in the Christian church, you guys. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and what I see now is just, it's, it's, even, it's, it's exactly what the Bible says, you know? You walk in and warn them to take down that damn Christmas tree that's going to take everyone to hell if they don't do it. And they just laugh. Who, whosoever cometh to me heareth my sayings and doeth them. I will show you whom he is like. Okay? Do you see this? He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose and the, and the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and does not is like a man without a foundation built on a, and built a house upon a, on the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. He's prophesying. That flood is the sixth seal. You guys, that's the sixth seal he's talking about there. Love your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing. You really think, you think it's about money? That's not what he's talking about. He's really not talking. He's talking about fleshly things, giving you an example of the spiritual aspect. He doesn't, and when he, I say he doesn't judge by the, the flesh as well, he, he's not condemning. That's why the, the woman, the parable of the adulterous woman, or not the parable, but the story of the adulterous woman, they were going to stone her. That's sacrificial law. They were going to stone her. And she deserved it, right? It, she was caught in the very act. And according to the law, she deserves to be stoned. That was God's rules. He said that. He wants no sin in Israel. And when people start getting full of sin, like they were, that's why the Messiah came to rebuke them. He kept judging everybody according to righteous judgment, according to the way it's supposed to be. And he came to elevate it because it was at a place where... It was time. It was the appointed time for him to come and do this. The, the, the sacrificial law was ended by his, by his blood, and he 
came to teach the people, if, I, if you call me Lord, Lord, but don't do what I say, yet, what did it say? I'll get, you do what I say, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. That's in John 14. I love to read that. I, I might read it after, but look at this. Thou shalt not go up and down as a tellbearer among the people, neither shall thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not hate your brother in your heart, equals, thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. That's why you rebuke him. That's your motive. That's the motive of people's heart. It has nothing to do, I could care less if somebody does something to me personally. That's never my point. I'll never make that point. I'll never argue and say, oh, you hurt my feelings because you didn't hurt my feelings. That's the thing. Anybody can say anything they want against me. It's impossible to hurt my feelings. You know why? Because I don't have an ego anymore. The only thing I care about is you guys. God made me that way. That's the sacrifice. I got rid of that ego, man. He's gone. I could care less. My, my zeal is for what I've learned in this book. And I, it's, you know, in a sense, it's uncomfortable. But there's no turning back. You can't unsee it once you see it. And that's why I spill my guts out for everybody else. But you can say what you want about me. I told my friends before, you guys don't have to defend me. Let them say what they got to say so that everybody can know who they are. Let the chips fall where they, they, they lay. Those guys are not doing the will of God that are talking against me. In fact, they're going to say and cause, call your name evil and blessed are you in that day. So I'll just thankfully take the blessing. Thanks, guys, to do that. However, you know, some people I can understand, they, they would take it personally what people are saying against somebody who helped them out. That causes people, but if I, I try to encourage them, don't worry about it. That's not the point. Just rebuke the sin. They're, they're sinning, rebuke them for that. But it doesn't matter for my personal feelings because they're, they're not there. I don't, I don't take insult to that. And that's why I can understand these blessings because I understand what he means because that's what they do. They, he's telling you they're going to do that. Another place it says in John chapter 5, or four, it says the same thing, it, or different, but it will say something similar. Well, I'll read this again. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt anywise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge. We have no right to avenge. So if they take from you, don't ask for it back. Don't avenge. Nor bear any grudge. Just forgive them. Let it go. Because it doesn't matter, you guys. You're going to be well looked after. When this is all said and done and we go to the kingdom, you'll be well looked after. It does not matter what happens and what you suffer here. In fact, that will only, God will bless you for whatever you persevered through this life. Vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. It's, it's exactly it. So let God do his thing. And you'll be surprised actually when you see what, you can see what his vengeance is. What is he going to do to his servants? Those people, all of you who serve the Lord, he's going to make your enemies lick the dust off your feet. Not that you want that, but that's what God wants. And may his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You, how could we forgive people and then want them to lick our feet? There's only one, one way I could even possibly imagine why I would want that. Because maybe they will be saved anyways. And how... You see, that's what my nose starts to hurt and my eyes start watering up when I think that he might forgive these people that, that have done these wrong things to even you and I. And I think when you, if you really have forgiveness in your heart, then you can comprehend that. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt let... Not let thy candle, uh, can, cattle gender with diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall thy garment mingled of linen, woolen come upon thee. Do you understand that's not talking about literally? I wish everybody knew that. The, the sacrificial law is really cool if you use it lawfully. This is just, it's telling you about your, 
don't let your 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 children be with unequally yoked with a, a heathen. And the same thing that's your seed, the mixing of wool and linen is is um, the 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 ways of the world. It's the pagan ways. That means don't put on a Santa Claus hat. That's what mixing wool with linen would be. That's their their appearance. Our appearance is otherwise. Our appearance is the, is the zitzits, which we don't need to wear them physically. We wear the Ten Commandments around us. They represent the covenant. And that's the attire you put on. You present yourself. They'll know who you are by being that light, by keeping the commandments. That's what it's telling us. That's We're not to go off the letter of the law. These things have spiritual meanings and context. That's why Paul very, very, very much warned don't you guys go back to those things. Those, the law is good if you use it lawfully and the Gentiles by nature, if they keep the covenant by faith, will not do the evil things that are written in sacrificial law because it's most of the time just describing the Ten Commandments. It's elaborating on them. But people take it to the letter and they do all kinds of things like put a box on their forehead and wrap their arm with, with uh, leather and grow sideburns down to here because they're not going to cut the corners of their beard. Things like that. Do you know anybody like that? You know, they put these little beanies on top of their head, doing these traditional things that are just man-made that Christ hates. Let's go to John 5, because I like that. Blessed are you when men separate themselves calling your name evil for a reason. I in Luke's account when he's talking in, in Luke there, it says they they treated the the false prophet prophets that way. When they when they call they say they're good and they praise them and you know, they're all happy. Oh, Pastor Bob, you're so awesome. And they're listening to these men and they're worshiping them. You see what's interesting about men telling the men who tell the truth if they, if any, I'm a man who's telling the truth. If I ever caught anybody, any kind of worship, I will rebuke them. I want nothing to do with that. Not just for their sake, but for the other people as well. People, when they see that, that it discourages them because especially the ones that know, know better. I think that you would, you can't get away from, way with it from, if you're a child of God, because the brothers and sisters are going to say, Hey, that's not how it goes, you guys. You know, you don't worship anybody. You don't, I'm, I'm a brother. I'm not a rabbi. I'm a brother. I'm not a, um, even when people call me watchman, oh, the watchman, the watchman, the watchman. Don't call me that. You can tell people that there is watchmen out there that are rising up and here's one of them, but don't address me like that. Address me as Mark. That's what you're supposed to do. I'm your brother. That's it. I am not above you. I have been given more responsibility than you, and that's it. It's Yeshua that we're serving, all of us. This is what he says. And this is to, and it, you know what it is also? It's to encourage you guys when you're going through the same things that I've experienced and you experience, then you have, you know that we're all on the same team. So when they treat you like crap, these are just reminders I'm going to tell you. Yeshua said unto the woman, Believe me, the hours come when you shall neither worship in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Okay? So the time is coming. We're going to worship the Father in another way. Somewhere else. Not, it, not in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. What's he talking about? Ye worship, you know not, not what? We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour comes... And it now is. Somebody argued with me the other day and said that it doesn't say we have to worship in truth. It doesn't use the word must. It certainly does. But the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers, not the false ones, the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is spirit and they that worship him must Worship him in spirit and in truth. That to me is a hallelujah. But to everybody else, it won't be. You know why? 
not everyone, not you guys, but I mean everyone else in the apostate church. That won't be a good, that's not a good thing for them because they're not worshiping in truth at all. They're worshiping in error. And even though the warnings are all in their own Bible, they won't listen to them. The Antichrist spirit of error, the, the Apostle John is warning them. First John, he's telling them explicitly to follow the Ten Commandments and that if you don't, you're going to receive the Antichrist spirit of error and you won't have ears to hear. That's why people say, all you have to do is call on the name of Jesus and you're saved. And do you think that they have a spirit? Oh, well, likely they do. If the Bible says they will be given up to that antichrist spirit of error, then they certainly have a spirit of error. Is it going to make them feel good? Comes like an angel of light. So that's why they're deceived. They don't want to hear the truth. But some do. There are some people in the church that God, the point in why we even preach is we already know what God's doing. God has his lost sheep in the church and we're calling them to come out of there. But we need help. What's been given you, you give to others. You got to let them know. You never know who God's sheep are when all of a sudden they wake up, but boom, sporadically out of nowhere. Something you, I, I've done, this happened to me many times, but people will a year and a half later contact me and say, man, did I ever hate you? You're such a, a jerk and all this stuff, but you're right. And I'm so grateful you did what you did. I'm like, amen, brother. I pulled a pastor out of a church like that. A pastor absolutely hated me, you know, on Twitter. And he is no longer a pastor anymore. I would have rather he stay a pastor and convince the church to repent. But I hope he went out with a blaze of glory. And he, he rebuked that church because that's our job. Love your neighbor as yourself. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say ye not there are four months and then the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he, he that reapeth reap, receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, unto life eternal, that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. And herein is the saying true, one soweth, another reaps. I sent you to reap that whereon you bestowed no labor. Other man labored, and you entered into their labors. He's talking about the prophets. You enter the work of the prophets, you reap what they sow, and together you will rejoice. I'm trying to find that other part, though. Maybe it was in John 5. I thought it was in John 4. There's so many Bible verses I got in my head. The one I wanted to read, but I can't remember where it is now. Slipped my mind. But it tells you that when that they will hate you they will hate you as they did the 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 old the um the prophets and they will separate themselves from you calling your name evil same kind of language and because they did the same thing to the prophets and the lesson he's teaching in John here if you read the whole thing you're going to see this hopefully you do that you enter into the work of those prophets he's telling you to, that's what loving god is and it's hard like in order to love your neighbor more, even though they, they take from you and, and, and um, that's that taking, their take, when you get the knowledge of God, you just pour it out to other people. It, you don't do it because you want to get paid. You don't do it for that reason. That's what the point is. You love your neighbor as yourself without expecting anything. You know, I'm tell, that's, what he's, that's the lesson he's trying to tell you. I already know that, but that's the lesson. You know, for the eight years that I've, I can testify of that. I've been doing this for eight years, trying to learn the word of God and, and allow it. And, and that's the thing. You got to allow him to teach you what he wants to see you is sit down and do it. And then he'll start teaching you. That's how your relationship with the almighty God is, is, um, 
established. You'll know. You'll understand me. You'll be in awe. That's what I want to happen to you. I want my Heavenly Father to talk to you the way, same way he's talked to me. That's what I'm trying to give you by teaching you these things to inspire you and to get you into the Word of God. When you start reading this stuff, and I'm trying to help you fast track it, if you take these connecting chapters and, you, and your mind is blown and your heart is pounding and you, you know that God just opened up your eyes and he opened up your heart to see it, he's, he's intervening with you. He told you, Yeshua told us that him and the Father will sup with us. Well, when he's, when he's giving, where is that? John 14, I said I wanted to read it, so let's go read it. Because this is where he's rebuking Philip. And this is where people don't understand. I think this is it. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were, if it, if it were not so, I would not have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. Unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, and whether I go, ye, you know, and the way you know, and the way you know. It was Sorry, it was Thomas. Sorry, I apologize. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether you, thou goest, and how can we know the way? Yeshua said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, ye know him and have seen him. What is he trying to tell us there? Is he telling us he's God? No. Philip, oh, it was Philip. Thomas said that. Then Philip says to him, Lord, show us the father and it, and it suffice, suffice us. Yeshua said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works." Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe me for the very work's sake. That's what he's rebuking right there. He's giving him trouble. It's like, what's wrong with you, Philip? Have you not seen the Father in me the whole time I've been preaching to you? I told you, I do the will of my Father. He sent me, his spirit of grace dwells inside of me, his spirit of truth dwells inside of me and I'm telling you what he's saying. That's how it works. That, that's how we're connected to God. And because the law came through Moses, how do you think Moses received all the information he got? God was talking to him too. How do you think Abraham got all that information? Why did Abraham take his son to Mount Moriah and go, go with a knife to go sacrifice his son and then all of a sudden he stops and sees the lamb in the trees, the ram in the trees, and he has the sacrifice? Because God's speaking to him. In a thundering voice? No. If he was always speaking to people in a thundering voice, why would he send those angels to, to Lot? And why would he send the, the angels to Abraham? There's different ways he speaks. But he's trying to show us through the whole Old Testament, even with David. Did you, did you ever hear an account where David was talking with thunder? Or th thunder was yelling out of this, the heavens? No, but he was in this word all the time, and he was hearing this through the spirit of God. In fact, I just don't remember where it is. Maybe one of the brothers and sisters listening remembers, but God would always give the kings his spirit. He would give them, it says he would give them two spirits. Remember when Solomon was asking for what he was asking, um, God asked him, he could ask for whatever, whatever he wanted of him and he would give, grant it to him in his kingship. And his most important thing was that he cared about the people and he wanted to be a good judge between the people. And God saw that and he was pleased and he blessed him with wealth and everything, but he gave him wisdom. That's God's spirit. God's spirit. And in, in the end, although he had God's spirit of, of wisdom and he was the wisest man in the world, 
his wisdom was polluted, he, even though he had that wisdom, in, into the lusts of women, which caused him to do great sins, which caused the separation between the northern and southern kingdom. And what did Christ come to do? He was wiser than Solomon, and he came to bring back the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom to be together again. But that won't be fulfilled until the last days, and we're in the last days. That's why this is going on right now. But that means that when you... Okay. The prophecy of Ascension of Isaiah chapter 3, I'm bringing it up again. You're going to see men out there that have the Spirit of God. Okay? They do. I do. But if they, if they do the signs, I've warned that. I've warned it even if myself. For your sake, I'm warning you right now. That is... If I fall, do not listen to me anymore. Okay? If I continue to tell you to go read the scriptures for yourself to see things, and I talk like that, and I show you what it's saying, and I'm not shoving anything down your throat that's not in the Bible, then you're okay to listen to me. But if I start going on vain glory and covetousness and stuff like that, don't listen to me. That's me warning you against my own self. Because if that does happen to me, and you can see it happening to other people, because the, the prophecy is, is they just want people to be worshiping them. It's better for me to have 18 people than 30,000 people. <coughs> that's what happens to people. It goes to their head. And that's why we even have thorns in our own side to keep us humble about the knowledge of God. Okay? I ask for, instead of asking for the thorn to be removed, Leave it in there and shove it in deeper until the day where your grace is sufficient enough, you know, because it's humiliating the things, things that, you know, you suffer with, right? To when you're, when it's, when you're looking at yourself and comparing it to God's eyes, you know, I prayed this morning and I'm like, I can't even say certain things that I'm doing. I don't know if I'm doing this right or not, God, because I'm not the judge you are, you know, even in my own walk. You know, like I can read this stuff and I, I went, went through a checklist on my own self yesterday, flipping through this and I'm saying, I might struggle with this still. I know I don't struggle with idolatry. I know I don't struggle with this because I was look the whoremonger, all that stuff. I don't struggle with that. I know he took that away from me. Praise God. But the other things I'm sitting there like lying. Oh, I mean, I don't know if I've lied or not. I've never intentionally lied because I hate lies, but you know, if I did or not, father, so I don't know, no liar will enter into the kingdom. I don't want to be a liar. I certainly don't love lies. It says, he who, who maketh, loveth and maketh a lie. I definitely don't lie and make lies up. If I lie, it's because I know I've lied like this when I tell you it's in John 14 and it's actually in Luke 14. That's the kind of lying that I'll do by mistake. I don't mean to. It's a, uh, um, a memory hiccup. You know, that's the kind of things. And I've caught myself and I get mad at myself for even those kinds of errors I make in a video. Like the other day, I said that the, the Jewish people uh, that are Babylonianized, they, they, they keep Sabbath. They, they're the ones that started it starting at dawn, but I meant to say sun, sunset. But the truth is that the Sabbath begins at dawn. And what they did is they started at sunset and that comes from Babylon. You know, that's the Chaldeans way. Watch out for the Chaldeans. Right? So, but that's the kind of stuff I'm trying to say, you know, even with my own self. I have to check my own self in the mirror all the time, make sure there's no log in my eye. You know, I don't read this Bible and say, um, I finished the race. I haven't finished the race. I got to finish the race. In fact, what's the warning? This is the warning. We were, me and um, Christine were talking about this the other day. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Those of you who do have the key of David and have a little strength, it doesn't say you have a lot of strength. That little strength is about rebuking the sin out of Israel because that's his word. That's not denying his word. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shut and shutteth and no man open. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut. 
for, for thou has a little strength and has kept my word and has not denied my name. While keeping his word, if people don't know what his word is, then they're not going to be able to keep it. You see? And his word is to go and love your neighbor as yourself. Fulfill that royal law. You're going to, you will, he opens up your heart to hear things. So some people may not get the key of David now, and I, they can go watch the video, but they may not get the key of David now, but they'll get it. They'll get it um, if they start loving their neighbor as themselves. Then, it, then, then it'll press on their heart. God has control over us. And if he withdraws our, his spirit from us, which he promises he's going to do this in the end days, in the ascension of Isaiah chapter 3, it's a very stern warning to the teachers especially. Okay, They're going to start going after vain glory. And we've got enough examples out there on the internet to see that it's already happened to people. As the day of the Lord approaches, the, 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 even there, all these teachers are going to go against each other. A lot of them are going to be fighting with each other. So you guys encourage me not to go that direction if you love me. And I'll be asking God myself because I take the warning to my own self. I don't just speak it to other people. I saw, I think Christine is here. Christine's, uh, those of you who don't know her, she's one of my sisters that we, we keep in touch and stuff and we sharpen iron with each other. There she is. But I'm glad that you posted that Ascension of Isaiah scripture yesterday. I was happy to see that. I, sh I think I reshared it myself too. So I figured that how to do that. So, but it's important. But because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly and hold fast that thou hast. So these people already have the key of David and hold fast to that. Hold fast to his word. Hold fast to his name. Hold fast to the meaning of his name. For my name's sake, it's very important. Because in Isaiah 66, which is already happening as well, there's people that are calling, um, putting people away, calling their name evil for his name's sake. And his name's sake is for saving the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They won't do it. They won't help. They're, they, uh, they, they, lose, they lose even that which they thought they had or they did have. They lose it. And that's about this Kia David thing. I've seen they deny it now like it doesn't exist. And they used to have it. They used to be on fire thinking, this is amazing, Those some of these guys. But now they don't have it anymore. Oh, that means something, something different. It must mean something different. They don't believe it anymore. That's the funny part. Like, iron, ironic funny. It's not good, but it's, 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 it proves to those others out there what's even going on. It, I hope it does. If they're wise, they, then they'll see it. But hold fast to that which thou has, that no man take your crown. You see that? I, I'm specifically talking to Christine. But you see how let no man take your crown and they don't hold fast to the key of David and they don't have their crown anymore. Or they won't receive it because of that. It's so important for ser servants to humbly, to God, not to man, in the sense you don't need, when you're a respecter of persons, I'm going to try to prove it to, to some people here that might not have heard this before. I know, get used to it. If you're going to remain on this channel watching these things, I will repeat myself. But I haven't said this in a while, but I'm going to, this is the, 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 the part If you have respect of him that weareth gay clothing and say unto him, sit thou here in a good place and say to the poor, stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? And how you judge, you will be judged, right? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him. Be ye, but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? 
Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, then thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of it all. So people will say, see, you can't, you can't fulfill the law. Even, even Messiah said to fulfill the law. But if you're respecters of persons, then you, you, you made it void. You actually just became a transgressor. Because people are thinking that this is really talking about materialistic things. And it's not. It's not talking about materialistic things. It's if you're giving respect to somebody who is, you know, a wealthy guy in the church and you're only talking with them, but then there's that poor person that doesn't know very much. You know? You're not sharing the word of God with that guy because he's, he's beneath what you think of your own self. Well, you're, that's garbage to me. That's garbage to God. He doesn't want that. He's going to actually make those guys the least are going to be the greatest. You know? And that's why, hey, let's call all you guys the poor folk. I hope you are. I hope you are. Poor meaning poor with the word of God. That's why he even called the disciples poor, right? When people look at things physically and not spiritually, what it's talking about, you, you start to catch on to the gist of this. When I was going through, I was talking to Isaiah last night, Brother Isaiah, and I said, did you not notice when it's talking about that checklist I was telling you about, about the whoremongers and the idolaters and the drunkards and the, all this list of things. I said, do you not notice how it's just talking about the way Hosea described idolatry, how um, Isaiah, how Hosea, and Ezekiel, they all talked about it in different slogans, but they're all saying the same thing. And that's the list. I think it's actually in Peter. Peter gives you a list like that, right? It's in, it's in Revelation as well. It's, in, it's even Paul. They all say it. They all say it. So what it's really saying is it's, what I notice it's saying even more is that it's just giving you, um, in when it says those things, it's saying, it's talking all about the same thing, but how the different prophets explained it. And that's how you take line upon line here, a little there, a little precept upon precept. You put it all together. And that's even when the, when the Peter was saying that, he gives you a list of things, but it's all talking about the same thing. In the checklist, it's all talking about the same thing. And your safety is keeping the Ten Commandments. If you keep that holy covenant, and God will convict your heart to, to cleanse you from other things that he feels or he sees pertinent in your life to change. He'll give you wisdom. He'll show you things. You'll, you'll have your, your, your times of suffering in front of him where you're trembling because of repentance towards what, you know, you might remember things in your past and you get them off your chest with the Lord. You confess your sins to him in your own prayers, your own personal relationship with him. You know, you may sorrow to him because of your children or your parents, depending on who you are. I don't know who you are, but these are the kinds of things that you're going to you're gonna give to the Lord over your time, your relationship. But the other part of your relationship is hearing what he has to say to you, which is, in many ways, it's better to listen. It's better to receive what the, what the Father is saying. And so, or Yeshua, is he, it, however it works, however you want to word it, you know, the, the, the father draws the, you're not, nobody can come to the father except through him. So how do you get the grace and truth? You know, first you accept, you accept what he's done for you, but you listen to what he said. And then you get the same spirit that was given to him. Maybe not in the same measure because he, we don't, de we don't even deserve it. Yeshua was perfect. He's the son of God, but he did that so that we could experience the truth that he, because he loves us. And so we get the spirit of grace and truth. If we turn to him and start obeying and start, I'm telling you, you guys, the way Messiah talked, the way all these people talk in the Bible, it isn't, it isn't by design, not easy to understand. When it says to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, what makes it hard to understand is because you're perceiving it from the American or Western culture mindset of what love is. But that's not what love is. 
it is in a sense, but love isn't emotional feelings towards um, your idea of Christmas Jesus, for example. Okay? Isaiah 55 tells, tells us that God's ways are higher than man's. His love is higher than man's. He explains what his love is. Because not only are you accountable for your own self in, in obe obedience because of your own life, but you're supposed to be an example to others. And that's the way we were supposed to look at it. You see, if I go break the commandments, I'm setting a bad example for you. And then you might go break them. I caused you to fall like that because of my own disobedience. And that's how, that's how diseases are started. Okay? And that's where we're at. So now we're lifting up and rising up out of the Gentiles. I mean, my mom and dad are Gentiles, you know? Well, maybe not, but still, they're, they're, they're still Gentiles. They're out of, you know, out, if they're out of covenant, you know? My mom's passed away already when I was a kid. They went to church, but they weren't in the covenant, right? But then that's, that needed to, needed to be. Do I believe they're going to be saved? Yeah, I do. By being a servant, he say, because my servants show mercy, I will show mercy. There's going to be people that were, are going to be saved who, who didn't even repent because that's the gifts of God. Why? Because of his servant's sake. That's why I hope <clears throat> in this particular generation, and Christine's probably the only one here that I know for sure will know what I'm talking about, but wouldn't it be nice if all those people that you've seen do terrible things actually end up in the kingdom and they're, and they're actually saved? They're not going to be in a high position, but the, can you imagine if they got saved? Because you know why I pray what I pray when I'm talking? Maybe this will help any of you going through the same thing. I already know they don't understand, otherwise they would have never done that. Okay? They would have never done that. So... I've asked for forgiveness and I've said, and I've pleaded with God and I said, Lord, this is the, you know, this is the worst generation and it's very hard for these people to get to the truth. It, you, you know that the only reason why I understand anything in the word is because you've poured out a lot of Holy Spirit to me, but you also opened up doors for me to be able to sit at home and other people don't have necessarily the same opportunity. And I know that they should believe that they could even do that, but this is me talking to God. But I'm telling, I ask him, I said, it is so hard. There's so many lies in this world. Can you please have compassion on these people who have sinned against me and shoved a knife in my back? They, it's hard for people to understand. If somebody's, say, really wealthy, they're not going to understand what I understand, okay? Because I'm not wealthy. I used to be wealthy, so I know the difference, you see? And I'm so much happier being in the situation I am right now because I don't, care about a single thing the next day. God always provides for me what I need. And I have been trusting him like that. So then some guy who's preaching, there's, there's, there's some people out there that got a lot of money and they preach and um, they are not going to be able to comprehend the same thing as me. Therefore, their wisdom is not going to be the same. And I pray for those people in, in those regards because they can't understand. They have vices in their life because of their because of, say, their money, they have vices in their life that they are not able to see. So when Yeshua said, when, for a rich man to enter into the, uh, it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. So I've, I said, one of the last things I said to one individual is, may the Lord rebuke you. May he chastise you, you know, because it's better it's better for you and your family. and But I've prayed also to God that, that all these men's sins are forgiven because I understand they don't understand. That's the point, you know. So And it's such a dirty world. You know, they all live through this dirty world. I recognize it. But my, my compassion for them is in the prayer for forgiveness for them because he promised me something. And that is John 20, 23. And when he poured his spirit of forgiveness out on me in 2000 and, and pretty much in, two, let's just say the beginning of 2017, I repented of the Christmas tree and I'm telling you like a massive anointing and that anointing was all of a sudden I could forgive people. Otherwise I could, I know what I'm talking about because, because I used to not be able to forgive people and you might even say rightly so, but now I do forgive people like 
That does, but it gives me a, a strong face against them because they can't hurt me. They can't, nothing bothers me anymore. You know, they can do whatever they want. You couldn't possibly do anything to me, say anything, do anything to me that would ever in any ways impact me, my ego, because I don't got one anymore. You know, the only reason why forgiveness is easy without an ego. If you do have an ego, then you can't forgive people. You see? But he took that away from me and he gave me a verse, John 20, 23. And, he's, and he's, he gave it to me. This is when I was just barely getting used to this stuff. I didn't know much back then. I did know stuff, but I didn't know much. I just did my first act of repentance or well, maybe my first knowledgeable act of repentance, really. Maybe second. Because, yeah. But, my, but against idolatry. And it was so amazing when he spoke to me. It was, it's, the mo it's my most favorite thing that has ever happened to me. It was more, more than learning the key of David, more than learning all the things I've learned in the Bible, was when Messiah spoke to me and asked me what Christmas was really all about and then gave me the spirit of forgiveness. That was the most special moment. Angels have talked to me. It was not even as special. Even the fact... When there was one time, and I said it to, I think, Christine, there's a time where I questioned, was it the Messiah that came and visited me or was it an angel? I still, that's still in the, up in the air to me. I don't know if it was the Messiah or not, but I'm suspicious because his sign was traveling. Especially now I'm suspicious about this because the parable of the traveling man says that, that he's like a traveling man that gives his servant talents and then, and then goes on a long journey. Well, that's the sign that the guy had that that I that in my angel encounter, his sign was traveling. And it was it was an angel, but it said traveling, and it's after that that I started to explode with knowledge. So, now that I've exploded with knowledge and I look hindsight's 2020, that could have been the Messiah that actually visited me, which would be it, it's not unheard of, you know. Messiah came to Paul as a light in the, on the road to Damascus. That's how he visited him. So I'm not, I don't put that off the side, but it's something interesting you guys might like to chew on. But that, you can watch my angel movies, but, or my videos, but that happened to me. And I, there's nothing, it was right, right before the Revelation 12 sign birthed. Right before it, you know. So... It's quite amazing, to tell you the truth. And uh, where was I going, though? Shoot, I forget. Talking about forgiveness. Oh, even more than that moment, which it, it's a pretty exciting moment, but more than any moment, my favorite moment ever, even when God first talked to me, it was when he gave me forgiveness. That's the most special thing that he has ever done for me. And I can't thank him enough for that, you know, because I know what I used to be like, you know. So now that I have forgiveness, it's like this burden. Like, it's like I'm, you know what it feels like? I'm just a freight train. I, and I just like with one fist right out in front, just plowing through the devil. You know, I don't hold a grudge against nobody. And I'm wise enough to understand what what's wrong with them and what they're dealing with. And I can ask for forgiveness. And he gave me that. It's like he gave me a promise by giving me, when he gave me that forgiveness, he gave me John 20, 23. And I'll just read it because you might not know what John 20, 23 says, you know, but immediately he gave me this verse. And that's how he worked with me. When he asked me to be a watchman, he gave me Ezekiel 33. When, he, when, I, when I repented from the Christmas tree, he gave me John 20, 23. So I'll read it. Thanks, Christine. I'll just read it right out of the Bible. I don't want to stare at the screen. The other people can read it. And you know, why would he get, this is so amazing. Okay. It's so amazing because even when he gave me John 20, 23, I didn't know the verse before it, but I went and read the verse before it. The same day at even being the, oh, where am I? 20, 
chapter 20, 23. Look at this. Then, tw I'm starting at 21. Then Yeshua, then said Yeshua to them again, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even though, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. You see, I didn't even know that before. I only knew, he gave me 23. And I read it and I, was, I saw the forgiveness. But I didn't see the verses before where he blew his Holy Spirit onto you. I understand it now because it's what happened to me. But I, I understood it after it already happened to me. Then I look in, he gives me the scripture after he already did it to me. And then I, then I knew, then I know now. Like it's just, God is amazing. And that's what I want you guys to have. That's how come I do what I do. But that spirit of forgiveness is wisdom. See, with, the, with forgiveness comes so much wisdom. Because you understand what people are going through that they don't even understand. That's why I can go to a church and they get mad at me because don't you you don't know me. Oh yes I do. Oh yes I do. I read the word of God. It it's a tattletale book. It tells you what everybody's doing. I know what everybody's doing it seems. I know how to deal with every single thing that that seems that people are doing because it's presented to me and I have the spirit of forgiveness. So I understand that's why you rebuke the sin. That's why Yeshua had so much power and wisdom as well. And, 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 and he, he, he brought us the spirit of grace and truth. That's the goal for all of us. See, when you have discernment, people, are, it's a gift that people don't like when, you're, when they don't have it and you do. And, um, you know, because you can see a bigger picture than they can because they don't have the same discernment. They may have their own mindset of what their discernment is, but they don't have the discernment that comes from that book. You see, they're judging in their own ways. But the discernment that comes from that book, God's discernment is very different. <laughs> So you and you know that's the amazing part when it's telling you details about our behavior is the most I can see. You know our other guys. I think probably most people try to talk about prophecy like kind of trying to give you dates and stuff like that. I don't know how you guys would interpret what you see out there, but you know they're they're trying to. Um, how would you say it? They're doing the same thing that like they should be doing it. I think they, I believe they should be doing it. These guys trying to figure out what's going on, but it's most important, at least from my perspective and what I've learned throughout these years is that we understand what everybody's doing wrong so that we can repent from it because that's the only way we're going to get in. It don't matter when the day comes, you're going to watch you therefore, but guess what that means? You better be being obedient. That doesn't mean you're, you're, you know what you're watching? You're watching for what God wants you to be doing. Not, which is what? Fulfilling the royal law. That's what watching really is. And then you pray always that you be accounted worthy to escape all these things. Then he gives you the key of David. Isn't that amazing? And he gives you a reassurance that you have been chosen and you, you that's the only way. That key of David, you've been chosen. So those of you who work with me and you can hear it, you have received the key of David. Hold fast to that which you have because he's going to keep you from the hour of temptation. Nobody wants to go into the hour of temptation. That's coming upon the whole earth. And it's coming soon. So he doesn't give his gifts to people for them not to receive it as well. I'm not, I am a, I'm a, like a slave driver, okay? I crack the whip. I'm a, I'm a, uh, like, um, drill sergeant, you know, get to work and help me out. I'm saying the same things I'm saying or what the Bible's saying. I'm saying to you for your sake, pay it forward to other people. Because like I said, you have no idea how much the Lord will actually pour out his spirit on other people 
because you're just being obedient. You don't have to be good with your mouth. You don't have to. I wasn't. I still, I'm still not, you know, it works though, you know, but you, you, you just don't know who will be impacted. You know, there's a little old lady three doors down. She lost her husband. And a while ago, we, we gave her some kind of a, you know, care package back when that toilet paper scare was there. Um, you know, I just, because she's, it's hard for her to get around and whatever. It just helped her out. doesn't matter. And, uh, but that's not, I, I just kind of barked at her the other day when she was here. I said, you know, she was coming and, you know, asking for a ride to go get cigarettes and stuff like that really late at night. And I'm like, you know, you can come here during the day and I'll give you a ride. But we were sitting there and I said, I said, um, I said, do you ever read that Bible I gave you? You know? And, oh no. I said, well, you know, the world's getting closer to the end right now. And if you can't see out your window, what's going on. And I give you that Bible for you to read so that you'll read it. So I, I rebuked her because you never know if the Holy Spirit will give her a shot in the heart and then she'll go and start digging into it a little bit because of the conviction. See, people aren't saved by favor the way they explain it. They're, they're saved by the conviction, convicting spirit of God on their heart, leading them to repentance. That's your helper. And then once you do repent, you receive the Holy Spirit of truth. The second which I could have kept reading because it's right there in John 14. That's what the second helper is, the second comforter. And then when that happens to you, then you start to see, oh my goodness, look at this. Then you start to come to this understanding. Like I think, I, I don't know who it was, but somebody was just recently, oh, I get it now. That's what I want to hear all the time. Oh, I understand. Oh, I always wondered about that. When you're wondering about things, that's the big guy upstairs pricking your heart. That's how he works with you. That's him talking to you. You see why I'm telling you this is because they robbed us of this in the church. They don't tell us that our, our, God works through our conscience. Instead, they say, oh, don't feel bad about yourself. Your sins are forgiven. They're nailed to the cross. Come on. That's not what the gospel is. They're twisting it. Those who repent, their sins are forgotten. Not those who don't. Not those who trample the spirit of grace. You want to have a look at that? I'm telling you, it's it so bother, bothers me that everything is covered in here about every single thing that they lie about. Well, I thank you for your obedience. You know what? I'm telling you, sister, it's the spirit of grace. When he says it's a gift of God, it's not of yourself, that's what he's talking about. I, I mean, to me, it's just, I'm just amazed, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, I, that's when he says, may, may uh, God's grace remain with you. That's talking about the conviction. That's the conviction and the wicked pastors in the church because they're, they're not operating. They're trampling the spirit of grace. Really, you know, you guys, if you haven't heard this already, Yeshua in Matthew 12 was warning us, don't you ever blaspheme the Holy Spirit of grace. When he's quoting Jeremiah 23, calling the Spirit of grace God's burden. He's quoting Jeremiah 23. And that's exactly what they're doing. Oh, we're saved by favor. He took our sins away. He doesn't even see us sinning. It, there's verses in the Old Testament and prophecy that, oh, he doesn't even see our sins. I can't remember everything off of heart where everything is, the numbers. But, but these, are, these are the key reminders. I'll talk a lot over and over and over again about the same thing because they're very important. That's why. That's what God has shown me to show you these things. So Hebrews 10 I think 29, I think. I'll read back. I'll go from 27. But, okay, I'll go. Okay, let's start right here. I was going, I was in Hebrews earlier. And the, um, look at this. And let us con consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And the good works is an idiom. And love is an idiom. 
God's ways are higher into the, it's the, the, the covenant and, and, and the good works, you know, it's loving, it's all the things that Christ said, elevating that law, loving your neighbor as yourself, reading the Bible, understanding prophecy, and let's consider one, one another to provoke unto love. To, I'm going to provoke you to do this. You see what I'm doing? Do you see I'm obeying? I'm obeying. That's all I'm doing. Not for myself, for you, because that's how you get helped. When you see someone leading by an example and you say, oh, that's what it looks like. That's what it looks like. So go do it and let it happen to you. And then you do it to others and so on and so forth. And let us consider one to another to provoke unto love and to good works. So go. I love to tell people this. Loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, all the law and the prophets hang on it, means you better understand what was written in there. And it's a, and it's a process. So get to work. That's how you love God. He doesn't want you to love him the way you think you should. He wants you to love him the way he said. This is how you do it. Go to Deuteronomy 6, 7, and 8, and that's the instruction manual that Christ elevated about loving his father. Right? Not forsaking the assembly. Not forsaking the Sabbath assembly. Assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we willfully sin after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. <clears> of <throat> how much, listen very closely to this. This is what Pastor Bob ain't listening to. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherein, wherein he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. Right there, it's the spirit of grace. Grace be with you. May the conviction remain with you. Pray that for all your brothers and sisters. I pray for all you right now in Yeshua's name that you have grace convicting you daily. That's what grace is. And these liars in the church are not telling the truth. For we know, we know him that he has said, vengeance belongs to me and I will recompense, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And by the way, do you notice the context of this is literally talking to us in the last days? Literally talking to us. As you see the day approaching, especially as you see the day approaching. You guys who, who, who know Christine and don't, and if you're not on Twitter, if you're not on Twitter, Christine can help you now with Isaiah's. But go to Twitter and go to his Sabbath gathering. I'm going to be doing a Sabbath type thing here. And I'll tell you, I'll give you, I guess I can tell you this. I'm going to reteach the key of David um, to a friend of mine coming to my house, but I'll put it live on, on here on the Sabbath. And then once he leaves, then I'll, uh, I'll do a, like a kind of a question thing like we've been doing a couple times in, in before. Um, but please go to um, go to. I have to pray generally. I have like hundreds of people that I, so there's. Um, I pray generally for because I know what the book says. So everybody's going to go through their their trials and their 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 things. But it's not much longer, and this whole world's going to be turned upside down. Otherwise. The things that I put here on these videos, when I warn something, they wouldn't be warning it if it wasn't coming down the pipe. Because even myself, I don't see until he shows me stuff. That's why recently I've been talking about the Chaldeans and Isaiah and I are going to expose some stuff and it's not very comfortable to do. But it needs to be done and um, for the church's sake and put the pieces together about what Isaiah is talking about. And I just... Um, when I'm ready, I'm ready. I When I'm pricked by the Holy Spirit to do it, then we're going to do it. But I got obviously I'm not ready because he wants me to know more stuff from the Bible. See, Isaiah has a lot of, of uh, 
knowledge, I'm aware of the stuff that he's aware of, but he has a way deeper understanding because it's more, um, for, how would you say, how do I explain how, like Isaiah has got, um, he, like he, Isaiah is a university professor. So he has better understanding of some stuff. I, I strictly speak from biblical um, knowledge what, because of what the Holy Spirit's shown me. And then, and then, and, 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 and he knows the Bible too. So that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is he's got something to offer to the table that he can probably better explain. But at the same time, I, I already, I already know what he's talking about in certain areas. And he's taught me all this other stuff that actually adds to this just crazy what's going on. And so there's things that are going to be not, uh, very safe for me to say, put it that way. And, um, but I mean, it's the church. The church is infiltrated by this new world order, the way they're doing it. They have it. They have a very, they've been warning us about it. Like they, they, there's people that have whistleblowed about it for a long time. And, and when you see how it works and what scripture already said about it, and it's, you know, it's, some of you guys are probably not going to feel very comfortable, put it that way. And, um, but it needs to be known, I guess. I know I don't feel comfortable even saying it to tell you the truth. So there you go. And I don't feel comfortable even saying it, but I mean, every single church, I wouldn't even doubt it if the guy that I went and rebuked at this corner church here that hates me. And I told you that in other, t other times, but I wouldn't even doubt it if, yeah, uh, like all the guy, all those pastors that I was calling all for the last few weeks, I wouldn't doubt it if they're all part of this organization. Put it that way. And that organization is written up in the Bible and it's called the, the Chaldeans and they go by like names like the Freemasons and the Shriners and stuff like that and they join these these uh, secret societies and their their mission is to... Um, and you can, you know what, go and listen to what they teach about their own selves. And you might understand that part of their job, once they join one of these things, they're directed to join a church organization, whether they believe it or not. But then they become influential. Yep. But the Chaldeans are... It's a much bigger thing than just that. The, I would say that these guys are more... These guys are just the walking, they're like, let's look at it like a chess game, okay? And they're the pawns, okay? The ones that are in the church, you know, I would say more so. Even if they're high, high level, they're still more so the pawns compared to what's really running them. Because the Chaldeans are the, are the whore that rides the beast. And that's that evil family mentioned it's the evil family mentioned in Jeremiah 8 and Micah chapter 2. So when you go and read those, if you don't read them, then I'll be disappointed. Because then you'll start piecing this together. The evil family mentioned in Micah chapter 2 and uh, Jeremiah chapter 8 is the Chaldeans in Isaiah. Uh, the really big guys run the world. So if everybody knows who the big guys run in the world is, it gets deeper and deeper and they, they, they've done some terrible things to their own people that aren't that part of that evil family, okay? Same group of people, one's evil, one's not. Let's put it that way. But they're deceiving the whole world, you guys. So there's certain Jewish people out there that are deceived by their own people. They're not like that. They wouldn't be like that unless they were deceived by their own people, you know? I'm talking like even in the, like in, it, it will, it'll run, the poison will run through everything, including the Messianic Jews and everything, you know? That's why there's all these, there's all these um, cults rising up. They're all, what, all you have to do is get, get a group of people together, start some kind of a new thing, Find some crazy man that fits the bill of charisma and stuff like that. And then you back them with money. And next thing you know, you can start a whole new other cult and it can grow big. And, and, it, and as much as the, when these people want something to get big, like say something like Black Lives Matters. Same, that was orchestrated by that 
same thing, okay? Same group. If you want to get the hymn books out of the church, you will go and figure a way to do that and you will push a charismatic movement. If you want a Christmas tree in the church, you will do it way back in the 1800s. You know, you will cause the people to do it. If you want, if you want, say, a country and to reestablish a country that you used to be in, you'll even raise up a leader to destroy your own people to get it. It get the, the plot gets thicker and thicker and thicker. And they are a bitter, hasty nation. They would they do not care. They do whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're a little baby, they will dash your head to pieces. And this is incredible. You know, it's incredible. And the book of Isaiah is repeating it over and over and over again. And that's what's coming down the pipe to us. So that's why this is why um, this is called the tribulation. You know, and this is why you, your leaders in your country are acting funny right now and nothing seems to make sense. And the right is versus, uh, ver against the left. That's why I'm warning you this way to keep your mouth shut. Don't speak evil against what the leaders are doing, but be wise to what's going on and zip your lip and really listen closely to Hosea or sorry, Amos chapter eight about this. However, I think it's in Isaiah. I'm going to go through Isaiah again today. So pray that, that he opens my ears to hear for your sake and my sake and everyone's sake. And when I'm ready, I'll, I'll, I'll expose what I can. And then, um, but in the meantime, chew on what I just said and, and don't, and don't, uh, and don't talk evil against the government. You know, you got to ultimately say, say this, have a prayer with God and say, my goodness, Lord, this is our fault, isn't it? I'm sorry for my part in that and repent. And then Lord, keep my mouth from speaking evil against the things that I should not speak evil against because this is the punishment coming. Keep me safe. His children who are wise will be prudent and they will keep their mouth shut in these, in the evil time. Okay. That's what his children will do. If you want to be one of his children, that's probably a better idea than sp speaking evil against what he's ordained to punish those of us who are evil and didn't repent because that's the purpose. He told us in Peter that judgment comes to the church first. That's how it's done. I know it doesn't, it's not very comfortable, but that is how it's done. Okay? So he, he allows, you see, he allows this. He allows it. So if you keep your mouth closed, it's a sign that you're listening. But you keep the, that holy covenant. You know, you analyze this. This is something you re, to take to heart. You know, if you're a wife, talk to your husband about this. If, if you guys are Christians, your kids, whatever. If you're a husband, talk to your wife about this. When the two witnesses that Christ sent out before him, Notice the, notice the similarities is he, when he, when he compares it to Sodom and Gomorrah and said that like, basically it was, it would have been easier for Sodom and Gomorrah than what this city's going to go, for, go through. There's two different accounts and it's Matthew 10 and Luke 10. Okay. And one of the accounts, he sends out 12 and the other account, he sends out 72 pairs of two that even equals 144, which is really interesting, but he sends them out and says that, that the son of man will come before they go out to all the cities of Israel. He doesn't use the word Judea in that, I can't remember which one is which. He says Israel, not Judea, Israel. That's the one with the, the, the 144. And it'll be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city. He was just like when he bent down and ridden, rode in the dirt, Oh, that's another thing too I just recognized too. He wrote in the dirt twice, okay? I talk about it. He's What he's doing, he's not fulfilling Jeremiah 17. What he's doing is he's showing you Jeremiah 17, okay? And he's comparing it to the adulterous woman. Are you guys catching on to this? If you know what Jeremiah, go read Jeremiah 17. He wrote Jerusalem in the sand, okay? He wrote and bent down and put the name of Jerusalem in the sand, telling the 
for us to see. That's the amazing part. How come nobody can see this, but these end days guys can? That's what makes us crazy. Wrote Jeremiah 17. He wrote in the earth and it's going to get destroyed. But you know what he did? He bent down a second time and wrote again in the earth. I wouldn't even doubt it if he wrote USA then. Because when you understand the prophecy where Ephraim and Judah dwell together, you see, because Judah is dwelling with Ephraim. It's the most powerful mixed up nation in the last days, full of different people. That's the prophecy in Genesis. And you understand that in the end, when you read all the prophecy and you actually love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, you'll start to see what he's saying. You start to understand prophecy. Then you love your neighbor as yourself and you go tell them what you learned. That's what I'm doing. Fulfilling the royal law. That's what you need to do too. So consider these. If he bent down the second time about the adulterous woman, and he says in Revelation, it says Sodom and Egypt. Well, Ephraim's in Egypt and Jerusalem it represents Sodom, the great whore run by the Chaldeans that deceived the whole earth, that rides Satan, the synagogue of Satan. It's just a, It just keeps going on. But Egypt is over there, that e Ephraim is in captivity in Egypt, spiritual Egypt, you know, where also your Messiah was, was um, crucified. And I always said that to Brother Dan. I'm like, I always wonder about that though. You know, is it talking literally physically or is he talking about the people? He was crucified for the people, even Sodom and even Egypt. Because there is no Sodom, we all know that. It's destroyed, it's under ashes right now. We know where it is, where it's located, but it doesn't exist because it's a spiritual context and even the Re book of Revelation explains that it's a spiritual context, it's spiritual Egypt. And then you start to understand from there that oftentimes when it's describing certain things, it's in the spiritual context. So when you do realize that and you see things that happened in the Old Testament in the past and you see Oh, they're spiritually happening again. Like I'll give you an example. You've heard of the BHI movement. The BHI movement is the same thing that happened in the past with the Canaanites. And that's why it says the Canaanites will, that spiritual, um, that spiritual condition of people is, you know, that's a, a evil spirit that's, in people, but guess who started that? The same evil family. They're the ones starting all this, this, all the controversy against everybody. And we don't want nothing to do with that. That's what the, the wisdom is, is to stay away from that and try to bring as many people to the truth as you possibly can and show them your wisdom. When you learn this stuff, how it works, if you can actually see it, how it works, and you can, it's hard to explain though, if people aren't paying attention, it's like, what are you talking about, Mark? Never mind, you know, there's, you just can't talk to people if they don't understand and paying attention to what's going on, even in the world. It's, if they do understand a little bit and they're not the type that are, when people want to yell, there's actually a few people I've, I've uh, been able to um, um, get them to cease from doing that and they see it now and they're very grateful that they don't do it anymore. So I'm happy about that. That, that's a big key, right? Because what God is, anybody who speaks evil against the government is nailing their coffin closed according to scripture. That's how mad he is at us. Do you see that? Do you understand that? He, he, because we, he is not happy with us for breaking the commandments. He's not happy with me. He, he's not happy with you. We all broke the commandments. Now, he sure has, shown me a lot of forgiveness and he sure has shown me a lot of knowledge that I know how stupid I am. So it's just, to me, it's like, I don't have to convince myself that he's been showing me all this stuff, but I'm trying to convince others so that they repent. But you know, he is not happy with us. The, the language in the, in the word, word of God against the end days generation is not smooth rapture, rapture ready. You know, that's it. They're, they're literally those people are even spoken of in the same part of Amos where the prudent are going to be silent in those times. It's literally talking about them as well, about these pre-trib rapture guys. I mean, I've, I've read it before, but it says that, woe to you who desire the day of the Lord 
to what end is it to you for it's a terrible and dark, gloomy day? You know, he's literally telling them. That's the people that are, are those are our enemies, you guys. The rapture people are our enemies, according to scripture. They, they, they've been given up to a strong delusion and they want, they, they feel that they deserve this freedom from all the punishment, yet they didn't even try to find the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They didn't pay any attention to any of God's um, uh, rules. And all they did was go after their own covetousness. Do you see? And it tells you that. That's the description of the people. From the priest to the prophet, from the rich to the poor, they will all be full of covetousness. Except for a remnant that retracts itself from that way of life and follows God's ways and returns, which is all over scripture as well. And it's God's doing. That's why it's God's doing. It's his spirit of grace. I tell people, and there's one man I really, I really love this guy. And um, I don't say much about him, but, you know, he, I told him about Christmas and I read him some stuff about it, what the Bible says. And immediately out of his mouth was, I hate Christmas. And I right away, I, you know, I just like, he doesn't even know what he just said, you know. And I said, but I turned to him and I said, you know, you could be one of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the damn church was never telling the truth. And they, they I mean, and I say damn because they, they are damned, you know. They, they're written of. They're the, the children of disobedience, the children of God's wrath and telling lies to the whole entire world. And you, we desperately try to get as many of those people out as we can because we don't want them to suffer the destruction coming because they wanted to go do sun god day and not correct themselves. You see, it's one thing to be ignorant of it. It's another thing to be in the, in the age of information like God said was going to happen, but then just go after covetousness all the time and not even care about preaching the truth to anybody. It's become like a big, big cult, really is all it is, of lies, you know? And the people, I don't know, maybe you guys can just do, give a thumbs up or something like that, or in the, in the chat, I mean, but like, did you ever question why is there so many denominations out there? Did that ever, like, say yes or thumbs up or something like that in the chat? Like, did, did you ever consider why there's so many denominations, yet did you ever hear Christ say that they, we, we we're supposed to worship in truth? Like, did you ever, did you ever count from um, Friday to Sunday and say, wait a minute, that's not three days and three nights in the grave? And they, you know, the, and they have these answers. They have these answers when you call them and talk to them on the on the phone, they, they'll say, oh, the way Hebrews are is that they, if it touches any part of a day, they just call it a whole day. That's just a bunch of lies that this guy just got fed, you know? And I've heard that by others, these passages. Oh, I know. And I'm like, and then here's the thing. So you just take, you take one inherited lie and you, you explain it off of another inherited lie. When did the Jews ever not get rebuked for their traditions and their inherited lies themselves. The problem is you didn't listen to what the Messiah said. Three days and three nights. Not, he even said it three days and three nights. He made sure it was written that way because he knew what they would do in the future. Remember what he says? I know that you do not have the love of God in you for one will come in his own name and him you will receive. I come in my father's name and you receive me not. He knows what you're going to do. He trusted the word of God. He believed the prophets, you know, he, because the prophets came from the Holy Spirit, you know, like it's funny, ironic, funny. People don't believe, like when you read, okay, they've created this term in the world called anti-Semitic, right? So if you speak against what the Jews are doing, you get called anti-Semitic as if you should care about that. But that's just like, it's, it's like, um, I don't know the right term, but, but you know, it's just create. I, I looked up the word anti-Semitic and it's talking about any, anybody in the Shem line. So if you're anti-Semitic, it means you're against the Arabs as well. You know, 
So whatever. I think that that's the way I can explain. It's just a stupid, stupid thing. What people, and I was thinking the difference between being anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic, is there a difference in all this stuff? I was watching a debate on that. I was just shaking my head at the, the nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, get ready. But look at this. At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves, and they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and the hosts of the heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served, after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth and the dead shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of them that remain of this evil family which remain in the places whether I have driven them, says the Lord of hosts specifically to Judah in Jerusalem, and it says, and the rest of that family where he has driven them. All of that evil family. What, why is he calling them evil? But they got their bones all over, all over Mount of Olives, right? They're laying out all those coffins for underneath the sun, the moon, and the star. So you got to believe the Bible. So it doesn't matter what people are trying to make themselves look like out there. And pointing the finger at you for pointing the finger at them type of thing, which is what they do. Not that I'm pointing the finger at them at all. I'm just showing them what the Bible says about part of them. That's why there's a warning. Come out of her. He's specifically talking to Judah in, in, in Isaiah 48. So what I'm trying to say about the Messiah is he knew what the prophet said. And that's why he proclaimed things. And that's why we know that they're going to call, everybody calls him Christmas Jesus. Well, they don't say it like I say it, but they call they call him Jesus because he told he told them that they would. And the reason is they don't have the love of God in them. And that's another prophecy right there because they're not keeping the Ten Commandments. And that's how simple two verses that the Messiah came out, out of Messiah's mouth that are right there for everybody to hear. And that's exactly what it is. And then he gives us wisdom to see it. Because when we obey, we receive the spirit of truth and then we can see the things that nobody else can even see right in front of their face because they got the Antichrist spirit, Antichrist spirit of error. Do you see how crazy this is? The whole world is deceived except for the very elect. That's what he says. And if, if it were possible, they, would, they too would be deceived as well. But it's not possible because God won't allow it. And so he raises up his servants, they start getting to work, they wake up the other children, and they start getting to work, and we wait upon the Lord, and we do that. And we watch out for the warnings of the evil servants that don't do anything, they're in there too, and they'll start backstabbing you and they lose their crown. I mean, that's, it's terrible, but it's the what the Bible says is going to happen. And then those who continue in the word and don't deny his name receive a crown. Then they get caught up to the throne. Satan gets cast down to earth. Then the woman goes into the wilderness and then she's led to the promised land, picking up strays along the way that never heard the fame of God properly because the wicked church was spreading lies to the four corners of the earth. So the two witnesses are bringing everybody into the, into the wilderness trail. Those who repent and he's casting fire, or they are casting fire down on everywhere, everywhere else, calling fire. Well, I think that fire is the 144,000 get called down, destroy. They go back up again. That's what I think that means, because the fire judgment is executed by the, by the 144,000. So, anyways, I might have gone on a little couple different tangents there, but nevertheless... Just trying to get the word out, encourage you guys. It's too bad we couldn't talk back and forth. But, um, yeah, you guys take care, and I might come back on later if I got anything else to say. See you later.